YouTubers, Brad C. here. Today we're continuing our study on the world's religions. If you haven't been following along, I encourage you to go back and look at all the other videos. I started with Hinduism, then Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, traditional African, uh, one variant of that of course is Voodoo, uh, traditional Chinese, the main variant is Taoism, uh, but I've, uh, I've covered all the bases. Um, so now I'm going to go to uh, Christianity. And uh, next will probably be uh, atheism. So I'm sure we'll get a lot of comments from those uh, characters. Uh, they are just as passionate as, uh, as we Christians. So let's uh, not waste any more time and get down to Christianity. Now, I know all the other religions, you're a little bit angry at me because I use the word religion. And I get it. Hey, we Christians, we don't like being called religious either. Um, you know, people that don't like Christians, they usually call us religious or part of a religion. Part of that reason is because they don't want to say that word right there, Christ. You know, the word Christianity, you're not going to see that used by non-Christians too much. Okay, for those of you just tuning in, uh, the reason for the study of the world's religions is because uh, I've always had uh, a lot of friendly debates with uh, agnostics and uh, supposed atheists. I really believe that most of them are agnostics just searching. A true atheist is not going to spend their time battling around with Christians and uh, uh, other religions. This doesn't make any sense. But anyways, when talking with them, they would often say, well, what about the Hindus? They think they have it right. And I got to thinking, you know what? I don't even know what the Hindus really believe. So I went out and I looked at all the world's religions. And I looked at their websites, talked to their people, and made my own discoveries. I wanted to see what was the parachute on their back because the plane of life is going down. We all know that. So as passengers on that plane, we owe it among ourselves to discuss our options, our exit strategies. So... I wanted to look at all the other exit strategies so I can at least be respectful. And now it's time to go to my exit strategy, and that is Christianity. Okay, let's dive into it. Uh, Christianity is a monotheistic religion based on the life and teachings of Jesus found in the New Testament. Christians believe that Jesus is the Son of God, fully divine and fully human, and the Savior of humanity, whose coming was prophesied in the Old Testament. Consequently, Christians refer to Jesus as Christ, or the Messiah. Christianity is the largest religion in the world, with 2.2 billion followers. It stands alone in its declaration that works cannot make us right before God. Faith alone in the finished cross paid the way for eternal salvation for all. Now as you can see, uh, this God is not the impersonal God that you will find in most of the other religions. Um, now you will find a trinity of sorts in uh, a lot of the other religions, but uh, they will be totally uh, different than the one you will find in Christianity. Okay, now we get to creation. Uh, the Bible's clear that God actually speaks the universe into existence. Now, what's interesting, though, is he actually gets down there and gets his hands dirty, uh, I guess you could say, uh, in a good way. He actually forms man from the dust of the earth. Interestingly enough, uh, if you look at all the elements found in the human body, every single one of them can be found in the crust of the earth. And then he forms woman from the rib of man. It's interesting uh, that the rib is the only bone in the human body that regenerates. If, if surgically removed correctly, and uh, also if you're going to do a bone marrow transplant, uh, which could actually be used to regrow organs, you've probably heard of stem cell transplants, very similar. Um, there's five donor sites. One of them is the rib. So I have a whole video on this, and I'll, I'll put it up there for you to see. Uh, but man was formed without sin. And uh, he was not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, basically, God was uh, slowly uh, cultivating Adam and Eve and teaching them. And to jump into full-on knowledge was obviously not acceptable. But Adam and Eve rebelled uh, with the help of the devil, of course, who tempted them. And they ate of the forbidden fruit. And then they become contaminated with sin. 
Okay, so do you have the sin virus? And as I've spoken of before, the Bible is simply uh, the history, the diagnosis, and the cure for sin. That's all it is. The history you'll find in Genesis, that's the Garden of Eden. And then the diagnosis you'll find in the law, and we'll look at some of the symptoms here uh, from the law in the Old Testament. And then the New Testament came the cure. And of course that was Jesus dying on the cross. So let's simplify this here. Let's look at some of the symptoms because I've often said if someone has uh, diabetes, and both of my grandparents passed away from diabetes, uh, it's a very deadly disease, but you don't just go to somebody that, uh, I should say the doctor doesn't just say to somebody that comes in their office, well, you know, you've got diabetes, I'm going to have you start taking insulin. Well, of course not. They're not going to stick a needle in their in their body. They're not going to take insulin unless you show them, hey, you've got the symptoms. There's 10 symptoms of diabetes and you have eight of them. Here are your symptoms. So once you prove to a person that they really are infected, then sure, they'll take uh, they'll take insulin. They'll 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 take the cure. But you're not going to convince somebody to do that until they realize that they actually need the cure. So that's what Christians, uh, we make the mistake of sometimes, is we want to tell people, hey, we, we've got the cure. And they're thinking, well, I don't need a cure. I feel good. And you look around and say, I, 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 I like the way things are going now. What you have to do is you have to very kindly and respectfully show them, okay, here's the symptoms. Here's the, uh, the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments. Should be the easiest thing in the world to keep. Everybody believes the Ten Commandments are good. But uh, can you keep them? And you're not pointing out anything that, that is different with, with you yourself. So, you know, as you point this out to someone, you say, well, have you ever told a lie? Well, yeah, of course. Well, that makes you a liar. Okay, of course, no one really likes to be called a liar, but everybody knows they tell lies, so they're not going to be too offended. Then you ask somebody, well, have you ever stole anything, Something, even something small? Well, yeah, maybe something small. Well, that makes you a thief. Okay, have you ever coveted? Have you ever looked at your neighbor's property and really wanted it bad? Well, yeah. Okay, what about adultery? Now, that seems like something nobody would uh, be guilty of unless they really were out committing adultery. Problem is, Jesus said, if you even look after another man's wife and lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. And we know that's true if you think about it. And we could go on and on, taking God's name in vain. Uh, have you ever put God second in your life? Murder. Uh, they, the Bible says if you, if you hate passionately your brother, you've committed murder, but we can understand. We'll, we'll, we'll let that slide. We'll, we'll let you get out of that one. You ever worked on the Sabbath? Um, you ever dishonored your parents? Disrespected your parents? Idol worship, you know, we'll let you out of that too. So, okay, let's look at them. Eight out of ten. You got eight out of ten symptoms. <laughs> and, and even these two, you can actually be found guilty of these, but it's just very comical. I mean, the Ten Commandments, you don't keep any of them. So what makes you think you're a good person? And, and, and you don't say this trying to make someone feel bad about themselves. I failed the test too. I mean, do you think I've never told a lie? you think I've never stole anything? you think I've never coveted? And we won't go on, but uh, you, you, I mean, it's embarrassing. No, no one likes to, to point out their sinful nature. The problem is we've all got it, whether you admit it or not. Now, here's the biggest problem with Christians. We like to point out those people over there. You know, look what they're doing. You know, I, I'm not like those heathens, you know, and it, that's just foolish. It makes you look like a hypocrite. I mean, we all have this sinful nature. We all need the sacrifice, the cure. And whether you, I, I say it like this sometimes too, whether you've got a little bit of dog poop or a lot of dog poop, your mom's not going to let you in the house. And if your mom, it's your mom's house, and if her standard is absolutely zero dog poop, then what do you got to do? You got to do whatever she says. If she says, you're not old enough, boys, to, to, to get yourself clean properly, so meet me on the back porch. I'm going to have to get down on my hands and knees and scrub you boys clean. And, hey, we got to do what mom says. Now, 
Of course, we can be rebellious and say, well, I'll just go wipe my feet in the, uh, the muddy creek. I'm sure that'll be good enough. Or I'll just wipe my shoes in the grass. You know, I'll do it myself. You can, but you're not meeting mom's standards. It, it's hard to humble yourself, to lower your head and say, I'm sorry, Mom. I'm sorry you have to get down on your hands and knees and, and do all this stuff for me. I, I, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. I mean, but, hey, you get in the house, don't you? And that's exactly the way it works with Christianity. you got to humble yourself. It's not easy. It'd be much nicer if there was a little checklist. I mean, trust me. I when I did the uh, the uh, the Islamic uh, Islam in a nutshell, I really was actually jealous of their little five step program. I mean, man, just to have a checklist. I mean, that's sweet. the The problem is though, no checklist in the world will will get you to heaven. I mean, you literally could have a thousand step checklist and fulfill them all. And what does it mean? You know, sadly, the Bible says that our good works are like filthy rags. You know, I mean, we're standing at the door of God's house with dog poop on our shoes. Now, some of us may have a little, some of us may have a lot. It doesn't matter, though. The standard is zero. The standard is perfection. Okay, the Holy Bible, uh, it's the inspired Word of God, provides mankind with the history, diagnosis, and solution to sin. It records over 300 prophecies fulfilled by Jesus. It was written by 40 different authors from three continents over a period of 2,000 years, but remains consistent in its message. Sin has consequences, and God alone would provide a sacrifice worthy of its payment with his own shed blood. I want you to think about that. Forty different authors from three different continents, um, various languages, and it all flows together with one theme. I mean, that doesn't really make sense if you think about it. If you just took a group of deer hunters from one small little community and had them all write a, uh, a chapter in a book on deer hunting, I guarantee you, you'd come up with all kinds of crazy different ideas. And it would not flow as a common theme. And also, in about 10 years, you might as well pitch it in the trash because any book you write is automatically pretty much out of date as far as anything instructional. Keep in mind the Bible was the first book printed on a printing press and it's Guinness Book of World Records uh, most popular book, most sold book I mean it beats the competition by the billions and also keep in mind that our founder uh, Jesus uh, actually the very essence of time now right now this is the year 2015 um, and it's based on uh, 2015 years after Jesus' death. So it's A.D. and B.C. I mean, the, the whole system, the whole fabric of time actually rests on the most popular man, by the way, on this earth. Uh, there is no one that compares. More people know of his name and about him uh, in a, at least a small degree than anyone else. Okay, what is the way to heaven? Now, this is the most important part um, of this talk, of course, and it's the exit strategy of the Christians. You know, everybody else has their exit strategies. The problem is they're all works-based. Follow these rules. Follow these steps, these five goals, these whatever. You know, if you can just master enough things, then you can escape or, or, or rebirth better or, you know, or, or make it to heaven. I mean, all the other religions have works-based religions. So let's look at the way to heaven in Christianity. It's very simple. It's the most popular verse ever spoken. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It was spoken by Jesus, by the way. 
He also said something else that uh, I'm sure a lot of the religions would not like because a lot of them, actually all of them, we, we've studied them all. They all think of him as a good man. But here's what he said. This wasn't uh, just written in the Bible. This is what Jesus actually said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's Jesus. He said that. John 14, 6. I mean, this is a very humble man. You're not going to see Jesus walking around puffing out his chest. But if you ask him the truth, and you say, basically, you know, what is the way? Well, right there is the way. He tells you. And, you know, of course, no one likes to hear that one way is the only way. But, you know, look, at, look what God was willing to do for man. Willing to take the form of a man. Come down, take the beating of the phlegm. Let people spit and mock and crucify him. And he did all that for us. So if he was willing to do that... I think he's earned the respect to say, look, I'm the only way. I'm sorry, but that's just the truth. Here's another very powerful um, verse by Jesus. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me, Jesus. He says that in Revelations 3.20. I mean, that's a pretty open invitation. He's standing at the door of your heart and knocking. If anybody hears that voice, I mean, there is no person that is, uh, you know, too low or too bad of a person. It doesn't matter. All you have to do is open the door and he'll come in. So to recap here, what's the difference in Christianity and all the other religions? All the other religions, they focus on you, you are the most important thing in this universe. You don't need God. And if you do, hey, God's up there somewhere, but you can do it. But in Christianity, that's totally opposite. It's stop you. You have no ability to get to heaven. You're, you're not supernatural. You're a sinful being. Every one of us are. There's only one way, and that's through Jesus, his shed blood. So you have to stop you. And yield to Him. It's just that simple. I mean, when you say, hey, look, I can't do it. I mean, I honestly can't be good enough. I can't follow enough rules. I'm never going to be able to, to make it to heaven on my own. And you humbly bow your head and you confess that, hey, I do believe that Jesus came down here. And He paid the price for me and I accept that. I accept that payment in full and I choose to follow Him. Okay, now today I've been mainly focusing on the Protestant side of Christianity because I'm fully Protestant. All of these pictures here are more of a Protestant take on things. Um, I will be doing a, a separate Catholicism video. Uh, Catholicism in a nutshell. I've had so many requests. I really didn't want to do the video because I really like Catholics and I really consider them my brothers. But let's be honest, they have some dirty laundry out there and... To be honest, I'm just tired of defending it, so um, I need to do a little a little study on Catholicism. Probably will step on the toes of Catholics, but and hey, you're welcome to give it to me with the Protestants. We're certainly not perfect either. We could use a lot of changes in our system. Okay, I want to thank everybody for listening to Christianity in a Nutshell, and I apologize for the lateness of this video. Had some family issues that have slowed me down a little bit here, but. Uh, I have all my other videos if you want to see those on uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, African traditional, Taoism, uh, you name it. Look up on my channel or bradctv.com and you can find uh, my little uh, video on all the world's religions. And of course, none of them are completely satisfied with me, but I did the best I could. And I tried to be as honest as I could to all the religions. I'm not looking for a way to, to tear them down. I'm simply putting them side by side with what I have of Christianity and seeing how theirs adds up. And to me, theirs all add up to a works-based religion. I do not want a works-based religion. I want one based on the work that Jesus did on Calvary. And I believe if you watch my videos, uh, such as Symbolisms of the Cross in the Old Testament and Why Did God 
use a rib to make Eve, you'll start realizing in your mind that Bible is a supernatural book. And if you read Psalms 22 and you don't see uh, Jesus hanging on the cross about a thousand years before He actually did it, I'll be very surprised. In fact, I challenge any Jewish rabbi to read Psalms 22 and not blush when you say that that is not Jesus hanging on the cross, paying for your sins. And he even announced at the cross, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And that is the first verse in Psalms 22 because back then the learned Jews, they had the Bible memorized. And when they talked amongst each other, they wouldn't have to say a whole chapter. They'd just say the first verse. And then everybody else knew what was rest, the rest was to come. So when Jesus was dying on the cross... One of the very last things he said was he quoted that verse, and that way all those learned Jews would know, oh my goodness, this has all been predicted. And, of course, the devil was there too. It was almost like saying checkmate to the devil. And after he said that, he simply said, it is finished. And just keep in mind, all the disciples died horrible, brutal deaths, not for what they believe would happen in the future. Sure, there's a lot of people that will die for their, their beliefs today, but they think they're going to get something in heaven, some reward. But these disciples, they scattered and ran originally when uh, the guards took Jesus. They ran and hid. Uh, Peter even denied him three times. I don't know him. But after they saw him raised from the dead, hey, that changed everything. Every single one of them was willing to go right down to the last man being tortured with all kinds of of horrible deaths and not one of them not one person said mercy hey we made it all up it was all just a story we made it up quit torturing me no not one person that is the most powerful evidence that you could ever have and that's every single one of them to the last man went down never once denying that Jesus rose from the dead because they saw somebody beat death and they knew that they didn't have to fear death. And you can have the exact same feeling. You can realize that, hey, I don't have to fear death. Jesus paid the price. He did it all. Put your trust in Him.